Welcome to all of you to session 14 of This is the Christian Faith. The Lord be with you. So far in this study series, we've looked at who God is in some detail. We've looked at what he has done for us and our salvation. First of all, through the life and death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, who has won for us uh, the gift of forgiveness and salvation. And then secondly, through the work of the Holy Spirit, who distributes this gift of salvation to us through the word of God and through baptism and through the Lord's Supper and through God's gift of forgiveness. And now in this final session, we're going to look at the question of, OK, how then do we now as Christians respond to this gift of God's mercy? Well, let's first begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will be with us today as we reflect on your word. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit to make our faith in Jesus Christ grow strong and give us great joy in believing in him and a great joy in all of the mercy and forgiveness that we have through him. And help us to respond in the appropriate manner as we live our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The question that we will be addressing today is this. Now that God has saved me through Jesus Christ, how shall I live? Many people, when they look at the Christian faith and see the different commandments that God has given to us or all of the instructions that he's given us for how we should live our lives, they assume that these are all the things that we need to do in order to win God's favor and blessing. But as I hope you've come to see, this is not true at all. Instead, God gives us his favour and blessing, including the wonderful gift of everlasting life free of charge. Not because of what we have done to earn anything from him, but because of what Christ has done for us. So the question is not what must we do to save ourselves or to win God's favour and blessing, but rather, given what Christ has done to save us, how shall we now live? And the answer is that once we've come to appreciate what Christ has done for us, our lives can never be the same again. And we will want to do his will. We will want to do what is pleasing to him. There's a story about a slave who was sold at the slave market. And as he was being sold, he was so filled with anger and resentment and bitterness about being enslaved that he determined that he was going to kill his new master. But when he was brought before the man who had purchased him, this man said to him, you are now free to go. Right, I purchased you so that I could set you free. You're now a free man. And when this former slave heard these words, he then replied, because you've done this for me, I will willingly serve you for the rest of my life. But this act of mercy, but this willingness to um, pay the price to set this man free, transform this slave in two ways. Right? First, his resentment was transformed into gratitude. And secondly, his hatred was transformed into love. And he was now willing to serve this man who had purchased him both out of gratitude and out of love, as he could now see that this man really was, was worth loving and serving. Likewise, when Christ saves us and sets us free, this produces in the Christian gratitude towards him and also love for him. So we come to see that he is kind and wise and good so that we want to please him, and so that we want to do his will. Partly because we love him, and partly because we can now see that he is kind and wise and good, and that his will is kind and wise and good, and therefore is worth doing. And that he doesn't give us his instructions to make our lives difficult, but because he truly has our best interests at heart. So now that God has saved me through Jesus Christ, how shall I live? 
The first way in which we respond to the mercy of God is by coming and getting our faith fed through the divine service. Now that's a bit of an old-fashioned expression. Most people, when they talk about coming to church today, will say, will say that they're going to worship, rather than saying that they're going to divine service. But I like that expression, even though it's a bit old-fashioned, because church is the place where God comes to serve us. You see, Christian worship does not look like this. It's not about us doing some kind of a good work for God in order to win his favour, hoping that he will then bless us in return. That's what pagan worship looks like. The pagans bring their offerings to their gods and do other things for their gods to try and show their gods uh, how devoted they are to the god. Maybe they make all kinds of promises to the god and so on, hoping to butter the God up in this way so that the God will then give them his blessing. And some Christians get a bit confused about this. And they think that this is what Christian worship is all about. It's all about us coming to praise God or show our dedication to him, to butter him up in some way so that he will then give us his approval and favor and blessing. But that's not what Christian worship looks like at all. Instead, genuine Christian worship looks like this. It all begins with the action of God. God is the one who takes the initiative. He is the one who serves and blesses us first. And everything that we then do is simply in response to receiving this blessing. So how exactly does God serve us when we come to church? Well, in the first place, he serves us by giving us his word, through which he imparts his wisdom to us, uh, through which he imparts forgiveness and life and salvation and joy to us, and so on. Secondly, he serves us through holy absolution, as we come and get our sins forgiven. That's pretty cool, right? That's one of the main reasons why I go to church is because I know I'm a sinner and I want to get my sins forgiven. Thirdly, he serves us by uh, inviting us to his table where he feeds us with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. To feed your faith and to give you ongoing spiritual strength and blessing. In the fourth place, God serves us when we come to worship by giving us his blessing. In the Lutheran Church, and in many other denominations as well, the service will conclude with a blessing like this one. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favour and give you his peace. Or it might finish with this blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now that first blessing comes from the book of Numbers and the second blessing comes from the book of 2 Corinthians. So this is the word of God. And what's happening here is that the word of God is being spoken over us. And remember what the word of God has the power to do. It is the power to do everything that it says. So this is not a prayer. Uh, I pray that God will bless you. It's not a wish. I hope that God will bless you. No, actually, this is a promise and a command, right? It's actually imparting the blessing of God to us. And then finally, God serves us in worship by giving us the gift of a listening ear. As he promises to hear and uh, answer our prayers by giving us those things which are for our good. Right, so first of all, God blesses and serves us and invites us to come into his presence to receive all of these wonderful gifts that he wants to give to us. And we then uh, simply respond uh, to what he is doing for us 
with our prayers and our praises and our offerings. Uh, not just offerings of money, uh, although we might give offerings of money, but most importantly, the offering of ourselves. If we, as we give to God ourselves and our time and our possessions, right? Give ourselves wholly to him, just as he has given himself wholly to us. All right, so as you think about uh, church, I hope that you would think about it in this light. This is not a chore. This is not a duty that we have to perform to win brownie points for God. But rather, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to come and receive all of the good gifts that God wants to give to us, to strengthen our faith and to give us uh, his blessing and to prepare us for eternal life. In the second place, we respond to the mercy of God by trusting in the Lord who has proven himself to be trustworthy. When we talk about living by faith and being saved by faith, we're not talking about a blind leap in the dark. A lot of people today seem to think that when we talk about faith, we're talking about believing something for which we don't have any evidence or for which the evidence is lousy or something like that. But that's not what we're saying at all. Instead, faith is an interpersonal category. Right? I have faith in my wife because I've come to know her and to trust her. Um, a few times a year, I will go away to teach, sometimes overseas, sometimes interstate. Uh, how do I know that while I'm away, my wife isn't cheating on me uh, with another man? Uh, how do I know that she's looking after my children and so on? Right? I'm not there to see what she's doing. And the answer is, well, I know because I know her. I know her character and I've come to trust her. All right, so that's what we're saying when we say that we live by faith. Right? Um, we're willing to trust that God will keep his promises to us because we've come to know him and his character. So I want to reflect now on this passage from John chapter 20. Um, this occurs towards the end of John's gospel, just after Jesus has, ri has risen from the dead. So we read, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his, in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put your hand and place it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, when Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, he's not saying that we should believe without any evidence or on the basis of some kind of a blind leap in the dark. Now, let's just think about this situation with Jesus and Thomas. Right? What did Thomas already know before he saw Jesus risen from the dead? Right? Thomas had lived with Jesus and followed him around for a number of years. He'd seen Jesus multiply the loaves and the fishes. He'd seen him walk on water, heal the sick, um, cast out demons, um, 
you know, make the blind see and the deaf hear and the lame walk and so on. He'd seen Jesus raise other people from the dead. And he'd heard Jesus promising that after he died, that he would rise again from the dead. And furthermore, he had the opportunity to see Jesus' character, to see how he was always kind, how he was always wise, how he always kept his promises, how he was never unjustly angry and so on. Right? So Thomas knew Jesus. He knew that he was the kind of person who kept his promises and he knew that he had the power as the, the Son of God to keep his promises. Um, then furthermore, uh, Thomas had the testimony of the other disciples who had seen Jesus alive again. Right? So Thomas had everything that he needed in order to believe even before he saw the risen Lord Jesus. But what does he say? Unless I see him for myself, I will never believe. Right? So Thomas is without excuse here. Right? He's being very, very stubborn and hard of heart and very, very unbelieving. Right? When he really had no excuse, he should have known better. He should have taken Jesus at his word. But Jesus is gracious to Thomas. Uh, he gives Thomas what he needs anyway, even though Thomas is hard of heart and slow to believe. Right? Jesus is gracious enough to show himself to Thomas to finally overcome Thomas's hardness of heart. Right, so that's a good illustration for us. Um, when our Lord Jesus Christ invites us to live by faith, he's not saying that we should you know, believe without any evidence. Instead, what he's saying is, look, I've proven myself again and again and again. I've done everything for you. I've you know, given myself for you wholly and entirely. I've died for your sins. I've risen again. Uh, there are many, many lines of evidence that demonstrate that this is all true. I'm willing to hear and answer your prayers and to do all kinds of things for you. And I have done all kinds of things for you. So now don't continually expect me to prove myself over and over and over again before you'll trust me. Right now, just be willing to take me at my word. And that's what we as Christians do. We take Jesus at his word because we've come to know that he is trustworthy. In the third place, we as Christians respond to the mercy of God by loving Jesus because of all that he has done to save us. As Christians, our love for God, including our love in action, that is our works of love or good deeds, are not an attempt to win the favor of God. Instead, they are a response to having received the favor of God because of his mercy towards us in Jesus Christ. In other words, our love and good deeds are the fruit of the gospel. One of the best passages from the New Testament to illustrate this is this story from Luke chapter 7. One of the Pharisees asked him, that is Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed five hundred denarii and the other fifty. When they could not pay, he cancelled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he cancelled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, 
but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So we can imagine the situation. That Jesus is here at this dinner party and this sinful woman comes in and she's weeping so profusely that her tears are falling down onto his feet. And she uses these tears to wash his feet and then she wipes them dry with her hair and she kisses his feet again and again and again and she anoints them with this sweet-smelling ointment. So she's obviously making a quite a scene with this extravagant display of love for her saviour. But the Pharisee who's hosting this banquet is not too impressed, and he says to himself, Ugh, right, if Jesus were a prophet, then he would know how sinful this woman really is, and he'd want to have nothing to do with her. Uh, evidently, he didn't realise that Jesus had come to be the friend of sinners. But what does Jesus say to this man? He tells them this story of the master who has two debtors, one who owes a large debt, the other who owes a small debt, and he forgives them both. And then he asks the Pharisee, now which one do you think is going to love the master more? And he gives the obvious answer. Well, I suppose the one who was forgiven the larger debt. Which is exactly the point that Jesus is making about us and our relationship with him. You see, if we think that we're pretty good people, maybe not quite perfect so that we need a little bit of forgiveness every so often, but still pretty good, then we will never love Jesus very much because we won't think that we need him very much. Instead, it's when we realize how sinful we really are we realize that our sin goes right to the core and that everything that we do is tainted by sin. And when we realize that there's no way that we would be able to clean up our own act or save ourselves, but that Jesus has done this for us at great cost to himself, well then how can we not love him with all of our hearts? And this means that love... And the works of love, right, good deeds, good works, etc., are actually the fruit of the gospel. If there is a lack of love in the church or a lack of love in our individual lives, the solution isn't to go around beating up ourselves or beating up other people with the law. As if, if we just lay down the law often enough and tell them what they should be doing, that they'll then go ahead and do it. Yes, it's true that we do need to hear the law of God. We do need to be reminded of what he requires of us. But this by itself doesn't give us the power or the motivation to do it. Instead, the power and the motivation comes from the good news, which changes our hearts so that we start to love our Lord from the heart, so that we want to do his will. And so that nobody needs to beat us up with the law because it's what we are eager to to do anyway. Right, so when there is a lack of love in the church, more than anything, people need to hear the good news. They need to be reminded again of just how much the Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven them. And then the love will start to flow naturally. In the fourth place, we respond to the mercy of God by putting our faith and love for Christ into action, by listening to his word and taking it to heart. If we love Jesus, then we will be eager to listen to him. And if we trust in him and in his wisdom and in his guidance, well, then we'll be eager to hear what he has to say to us. I love this story from 
Luke chapter 10, which illustrates the importance of listening to Jesus' words. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Now what I like about this story is the way it illustrates what's truly important in life. Most of us look at Martha and we feel a fair bit of sympathy for her because what she's trying to do is something good. Right? She's probably trying to uh, fix Jesus a delicious meal, maybe get a bed ready for him to sleep in and so on. And we would say, well, these are all good things, right? Surely Martha should be commended. But Jesus gently rebukes her instead because she doesn't have her priorities sorted out. I'm guessing that Jesus would actually have been quite happy if she'd just given him bread and water to eat, if only she would sit and listen to him. Right? Because this is what is most important. And in fact, Jesus says this is the only thing that is truly essential. And he's not just talking about that situation back then. The same is true for us today. There is only one thing that is truly essential in life. And that is that we have Jesus and that we are willing to listen to what he has to say to us. Right? Absolutely everything else could go wrong in our lives. Right? Our lives could be a disastrous mess. We could lose our jobs. We could be in poverty in the gutter. We could be you know, attacked by all kinds of enemies and problems. Everything else could go wrong. But if we have Jesus and his words, right, the words that bring eternal life, we actually have everything, right? Because the worst that can happen to us is that we die and go to heaven and live in joy forever, right? So that's really not so bad. Whereas if we don't have Jesus and his words, it doesn't matter what else we might have. We might be the richest happiest, most successful person here in world, worldly terms, we actually have nothing because it's only a matter of time before we die and lose it all. Right? So Jesus is trying to teach us some perspective here, right? that there is nothing more important in life than listening to him and his words. And if we truly believe that he has the words of eternal life, we will see that this is true. In the fifth place, we respond to the mercy of God by putting our faith into action by praying. This is what we read in Philippians chapter 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, if our faith is in ourselves and we think that by our own strength or our own cleverness, we can deal with all of the different problems that confront us in life, well, then we won't bother to pray. Or if we don't really believe that Jesus hears and answers prayer, then we won't bother to pray. But if we believe his promises, that he is eager to hear and answer our prayers and to help us in all the trials that we face in life and to give us all of those things that are for our good, well then we'll be eager to ask him and we will go to him in every need. And the result of this, as our text says, is that we will then have peace of heart and mind. We won't be worried and anxious, right? Because we will put all of that in Jesus' hands, trusting that he will care for us. In the sixth place, we respond to the mercy of God and show our love for Jesus by loving others in the same way that he loves both them and us. 
A good story to illustrate this comes from Luke chapter 10, where we read, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbour as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbour? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbour to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Now in the first place, this story illustrates the kind of love that Jesus has shown to us. Right? We are people who were in desperate straits and who were perishing until Jesus came along and saw our need and refused to pass by on the other side, but instead stopped and helped and saved us. But then in the second place, this story is an illustration of how Jesus wants us to respond to his love. He doesn't want us to respond to his love by paying him back. But that would be impossible because there's actually nothing that he needs from us. Right? He's up there in heaven with all the heavenly angels and glory and wealth and splendor. Right? There's nothing that he needs. Instead, he wants us to pay it forward by showing similar love to other people. As Luther used to say, God does not need our good works, but our neighbours do. Or as Jesus tells us, the way in which we serve and love him is by serving and loving others. There's a story that's often told about Martin of Tours, who was a very prominent uh, Christian and bishop uh, in, the in the 4th century AD. And the story is that when he was a young man, he served as a Roman soldier. And he was uh, entering a town one day on his horse where he, when he saw a poor beggar shivering in the cold. So on an, an impulse, he got off his horse, took his sword, cut his Roman uh, warm travelling cloak in half, gave half of it to the beggar to wrap himself in, uh, then wrapped himself in the rest of it and continued on his way. But then that night he had a dream and in this dream he saw Jesus wrapped in half of a Roman soldier's cloak. And uh, the angels of God were puzzling over this and asked Jesus where he got this cloak from. And Jesus said, my friend Martin gave it to me. Now, I don't know if this story is true or just a legend, but either way, it illustrates something that the New Testament teaches us, which is that whenever we do something for the least of Jesus' brethren, right, for, the, for anyone who is in need, we've done it for Jesus. Right, and Jesus regards that as something that was done for him. So whenever we look at other people, particularly those who are in need, we should see Jesus. We should see someone who is loved by Jesus. We should see someone for whom Jesus died. And we should see this as an opportunity for us to put the love of Jesus or, the, or our love for Jesus into action by loving that person in the same way that Jesus has loved us. 
and this includes loving our enemies. Remember that it is while we were God's enemies that Christ died for us. And he tells us to love our enemies and to pray for those who hate us. A good illustration of this that is drawn from church history is the story of Dirk Willems, a Christian man who was imprisoned in 1569 for his Christian faith. And the place where he was imprisoned was the upper room of a castle that was surrounded by a moat. And he managed to escape from this room by making himself a rope out of knotted rags and lowering himself down by means of this rope from this from the upper window of this room down onto the moat, which had frozen over, given that it was the middle of winter. And he then fled across the frozen moat to the other side. But as he was fleeing, a palace guard noticed him escaping and chased after him. And whereas Dirk was relatively light, partly because he'd been half-starved during his imprisonment, the much heavier prison uh, uh, palace guard broke through the ice and fell down into the freezing cold water. And when Dirk noticed what had happened to the palace guard, instead of making good his escape, he turned back to pull this man out of the water. Now, at first, the palace guard wanted to let him go, but by this stage, his superiors were looking on and were making all kinds of threats against him if he did that. And so he ended up arresting Dirk, and Dirk was then put in a much more secure prison and ended up being burned at the stake. Right, so this is the kind of love that Christ calls on us to show to our enemies. Now, when we show this kind of love to our enemies, sometimes this will end up changing their hearts and they will give up their enmity and become our friends instead. Right? When we show this kind of love, even to those who hate and persecute us, this is a very powerful witness that can win people over for Christ. But sometimes they will remain our enemies and will continue to persecute us. And Christ tells us, to love them anyway. And when we do, we then have the honour of following in the footsteps of Christ and we will receive our heavenly reward. And furthermore, loving our neighbours means sharing with them the good news. As Christians, Christ calls on us to use every opportunity to share the good news with those around us. And in fact, this is what love requires. Right? As Christians, we have the forgiveness of all of our sins. We have the gift of everlasting life and joy. But many of those around us are perishing. They have not received the gift of forgiveness. And therefore, they are headed for death and hell. So how can we claim that we love them if we are not willing to share with them the only thing that can save them? In the seventh place, we respond to the mercy of God by forgiving others in the same way that God has forgiven us. This is what we read in the book of Colossians. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. You see, the forgiveness of sins is at the absolute heart of the Christian faith and the Christian life. And to live as a Christian means, above all, to live as a forgiven and forgiving person. Not as a self-righteous person, but rather as someone who rejoices in the mercy of God, who rejoices in being able to receive this mercy for themselves, and who is also eager to extend this same mercy to other people. Nothing is a worse witness or a greater denial of what our Lord has done for us than a refusal to forgive. And finally, we as Christians respond to the mercy of God by living lives of selfless service. 
The final section of Luther's small catechism is called the Table of Duties. And this is simply a collection of different Bible passages that give us instructions for how we are to live if we are pastors or if we are lay people who are called to respect our pastors and listen to them and support them. On how we are to behave if we find ourselves in government and how we are to behave if we are citizens who are called to respect that government. How we are to behave if we are husbands, how we are to behave if we are wives, how we are to be, behave if we are parents or children or employers or employees and so on. Now I won't go through this in any detail, you can have a look at it for yourself, but instead I want to make some more general comments about this section of the Catechism. What we see here is that for the sake of good order in human society, God calls different people into leadership positions in different situations so that we can all work together for the common good. And uh, if we then find ourselves in a subordinate position, we are then called to support those that God has called into leadership positions. Now, it doesn't take a lot of reflection to see that it's important uh, to have some kind of structure to human society so that we all pull, pull together. You see this in the military. Uh, in the military, all of the soldiers need to listen to their commanding officer so that the unit works together rather than all of the soldiers each doing their own thing. And the military recognises that this is vitally important because if they don't all work together, they're all likely to get killed. The same is true on a sporting team. Right? The whole team needs to listen to the captain and the coach so that they all work together. And if they don't do that, they're not likely to have any success. And the same is true in all kinds of other situations in life. Uh, sometimes, in certain situations, God leaves us free to select our leaders, but in other situations, God is the one uh, who makes it quite clear who he wants to be in a particular leadership position. Now, note that this is not about superiority or inferiority. We see that in his earthly life, Christ submitted to his Father, even though he was not in any way inferior to his father. We also see that he was obedient to his earthly parents when he was a child, even though as the son of God, he was clearly superior to them. Um, on a sporting team, the captain is not necessarily more important than the star player. Right? They're both important, they just have different roles. Uh, but the star player, no matter how skilled he, need, he may be, has to listen to the captain so that he's working as part of the team. Uh, children are called, in the Bi called by God in the Bible to obey their parents. But that doesn't mean that kids are inferior to adults. Right? Those same children will grow up to be adults themselves one day and may end up um, greatly surpassing their parents in terms of what they achieve in life. And they'll probably end up being parents themselves one day. And sometimes, in fact, the, the roles can be reversed in different situations. Uh, if the Prime Minister of Australia were to walk into my church and become a member of my congregation, uh, he would be called to submit to me as the pastor, at least when it comes to spiritual matters and the affairs of the church. But then when I walk out onto the street, I'd be <laughs> called to obey the uh, traffic laws and the other laws of the land which have been established by him and his government, right? So then the role would be reversed. I remember when I was at seminary, um, my dad was one of the teachers for a time. And uh, at the same time, uh, quite a few of the seminary students, together with me and my dad, all played on the same cricket team. And one of the students at the seminary was the captain of the cricket team. So in class, this student had to submit to my dad as his teacher, 
But then when we went, we went out onto the cricket field, the roles were reversed, and my dad then had to submit to him as the captain. Okay, so it's not about who's better than another. Instead, it's about different avenues of service uh, in different situations. All right, so the call here for us as Christians is to respect the good order that God has established in human society and to strive to live lives of Christ-like service, whether we are in a leadership position or whether we are in a subordinate position we're called to use that position to serve in a Christ-like way. Right, so if we find ourselves in a leadership position, we are called by God to use whatever authority comes with that position, not to serve ourselves or to feather our own nest, but rather to serve all of those who are under us. Similarly, if we find ourselves under authority in a subordinate position, we are, we are still called to seek to serve in a Christ-like way, in the place that God has put us, rather than fighting to be top dog. And then leave it in God's hands to elevate us if he chooses to do so. Right, we're called to do this partly because we recognize that in power struggles, it's usually just a case of human selfishness, and in such struggles, no one wins. Uh, so instead of fighting to be top dog, we are called to respect those in authority and to respect the good order that God has established and to work for the common good. Now that doesn't mean that we are called to mindlessly submit or obey, even if those above us are doing something that's really evil. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear that whenever there's a choice between listening to God or listening to human beings, we must listen to God. And that all authority stands underneath God's authority. So if those above us are telling us to do something that is clearly wicked or foolish in the light of God's word, then we are free to listen to God instead of them. In fact, no, that's the wrong language. We must <laughs> listen to God rather than listening to them. But this is not about trying to elevate ourselves to become top dog. Rather, this is about submitting to the authority of God himself. All right, so those are some general comments. Now let's look at how what this looks like in a very specific situation. To do this, I want to consider this passage from Ephesians 5 and 6 where we read, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Uh, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleases, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, 
knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Right, so let's unpack that a little bit. Let's first reflect on what this says to husbands, right? The Bible makes it very clear that God has called husbands to be the heads of their families. But what does that actually look like? Many people, when they hear that, assume that it means that, oh, okay, that means the, the husband or the father is the boss and, and therefore he has the right to boss everybody else around. But that's not what the Bible teaches at all. It says, yes, he is called to be the head of the family, but that means that he, is, he must use this position as head of the family to serve everybody in the family in a Christ-like way. Right? To serve his children by caring for them and teaching them the faith and being patient with them and so on. And to serve his wife by loving her and serving her in a Christ-like way. And let's think about what that actually means, right? How did Christ love the church? Well, he, he loved the church by holding nothing back, giving everything that he had to the church, including his own life. Right? So he ended up dying for the church. So I say to husbands, if you were to love your wives in a Christ-like way, then you must be willing to die for them, quite literally. Right? If you are in a ship that is sinking and there's only one spot left in the lifeboat, you need to make sure that your wife gets into the lifeboat and that you go down with the, sh with the ship. And if she then says, oh, no, 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 I'll happily sacrifice myself for you. You get in the lifeboat. You need to say, no, right? God gave that job to me and not to you. You make sure that you get in that lifeboat and that your life is saved. Okay, so quite literally, you have to be willing to die for your wife. But the chances are that most days you won't have to literally die for your wife. But if you have this attitude in you, well, then you will also be willing to serve her in 101 other ways on a daily basis. Right? So if you're willing to die for your wife, then you'll also be willing to do the dishes for your wife. And you'll be willing to seek to serve her um, in every way that you can. Now, let's reflect on this a little bit more, right? Because why did Christ die for the church? Well, above all, he died for the spiritual needs of the church, right? As our text emphasizes, right, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her or make her holy, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the words that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Right, so above all, Christ was seeking the spiritual well-being of his wife. So again, husbands, this means uh, that if you are to love your wives in a Christ, Christ like way, you need to be the spiritual head of your family who is constantly seeking the spiritual well being of your wife and of your children. So, in practical terms, to be the head of the family means to be the first one who says, Let's go to church. It means that you need to strive to be the first one who says, Let's study God's word together. And let's consult it as we make our decisions in life. Right? To be a, the head of the family means to be the first one who um, says, let's pray about this when you're faced with a difficult situation or, or just generally in life. Uh, to be the head of the family means to be the, the one when there's a conflict who strives to be the first one who says, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And it means to be the first one who says, I forgive you. Right, so that's what it means to be a spiritual head of the family. Not to selfishly boss everyone else around, but to strive to serve them all in a Christ-like way. All right, so that's the call for husbands. 
And then the call for wives is to respect this position that God has given to their husbands so that they don't try to wear the pants and don't try and elevate themselves and uh, try and get their husbands under their thumb. Right? But respect the fact that God has made him the head of the family and to support their husbands in being the best possible leader that he can be. Right? And to serve him and the whole family uh, in this way. Right, so that's the situation with husbands and wives, but we could extend the same kind of thinking to other situations, to uh, citizens and their relationship with those in government, uh, to employers and employees, and so on. All right, so those are some of the most important ways in which we as Christians respond to the grace of God. But as we reflect on this, at least if our consciences are at all sensitive, we should realize that we all continually fall short. And so above all, the Christian life looks like this. Yes, we strive to do the will of God, but all too often we fail. So what do we do when we fail? We then repent. Right? The life of a Christian is a life of daily repentance striving to do the will of God. But then when we mess up, what do we do? Oh, we confess our sins. I'm sorry, God, or uh, apologize to whoever we've, we've sinned against. And then we turn and receive the forgiveness of God once more. Turn back to him to receive that forgiveness and grace and life and salvation that he gives freely to us so that with his help, then we can have another go. And that's what the Christian life looks like. That is all for this study series. This session is the last session in the series. And I hope that this session and the whole study has been of great spiritual benefit to you. But let's now conclude as we usually do uh, with the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favour and give you his peace. Amen.